everybody. I welcome you on behalf of the organizers of this event to our session on how impact investment in innovative financing could trigger a systemic change in the wider wash sector, wash nexus. My name is Johannes Heep from SIVAS, and it is a pleasure for me to guide you through this uh, one hour event. For today's session, we invited six speakers and two further experts to challenge the speakers after the presentations. The presentation will be Pecha Kutcha style, probably some of you know that, you know, this will support a bit our timekeeping, make the event a little bit more lively. Now two logistical infos, one we record the session. That's one point, and the second one, um, you will find in the chat, if you look now into the Zoom chat, you will find uh, actually the number you have to type into a Slido window to connect you with our uh, Slido, um, which will run parallel, parallelly to run uh, to collect questions. Now, let's start with the session. Uh, let's start the session with a poll, and I hand over to Marisa. You are the controller of our poll. Thank you very much. I will share now the, well, I have shared the, the Slido where you can ask your questions, as Johannes said already. And also in the same um, Slido, we will start also a poll. So the question section you have on one side there, you can also like the questions of other participants. So if you don't want to type your own question, but you see a, a question where you would like to really hear what the speakers have to say about it, you can like it to make sure it's on top of the, the question list. So please use also this function to, to make sure that your question will be asked. So then on the same slide, we have a poll where we would like you to type just short keywords to the question, why do only 3% of impact investment go into the water sector? You will hear um, some inputs to that during our presentations. So also during this time, you will have to the possibility to answer the question in the poll. And then after during the question and answer session and the, the challenges panel, we will get back to this um, word cloud. So please go to the Slido, put questions, answer the, the poll during the speakers are presenting and then we'll be back. Thank you. Back to you, Johannes. Okay, thank you. So let's start. You know, Florian Abe is our first speaker. Florian is a researcher at the Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth, CSP at the University of Zurich. He explores real world impact of sustainable investing and how investors integrate impact into their discussion making. Now, Florian, how can investors change the world? Can they change the world? So oh, thanks, Johannes, for the introduction. So the point I want to make is the investment industry needs to stop focusing on investments that merely feel green and move on to investments that cause real world change. So let me say why I think so and what investors can do to really make a difference. So first of all, we certainly have enough challenges that require financing. So this is the World Water Week. In a broader context, we have the SDGs. 70 goals UN has set to, to reach until um, 2030. So we all know to reach the SDGs, that's going to require a lot of money. There's this estimate of the SDG funding gap in which UN estimates that until 2030, every year, we need additional investments of 2.7 trillion US dollars. So 2,700 billion US dollars in additional funding every year. That sounds like an awful lot. So I recently compared that to the total amount of money that is flowing into sustainable investments. So any investor is putting money into sustainable assets. And to, to my surprise, this number is way higher. So in to, between 2016 and 18 per year, there's something like 4 trillion US dollars flowing into sustainable investments. Now, if you look out of the windows, uh, and then in the newspapers and so on, we know the SDGs, we're not really on track to reach them. So 
uh, we haven't solved the world's problem. So what's going wrong here? And this all revolves about the question uh, around the question of what's the impact of sustainable investments and how can investors have impact? And that's basically what we at the CSP did a lot of research on. And let me share some key insights and key concepts. So first of all, what is impact to start with? So impact is a change in real world that is caused by your activities. That sounds trivial, but it has this aspect of causality. So impact is only what changes beyond what would have happened anyhow. So this is called additionality in investment context or counterfactual impact. So you always need to think about, I mean, what would have happened without my investment? Now, if you, if you transfer this definition to an investment space, it has one key insight. So your impact is not the impact of the companies or the projects you own. It's a change you make in these projects. So it helps differentiate between company impact, which is what companies, the, the effect companies have on the real world. For example, a, a wastewater treatment plant um, cleaning water. So that's on company level. I mean, and I feel a lot of discussion is around this topic. 99% of discussion in the investment world is about company impact. But what's missing is the other part, investor impact. So the effect you as an investor have on a given company, and we define investor impact as the change of company impact that is caused by investment activities. And basically, if we, we, we review all the existing knowledge on financial markets, we, we, we basically see two ways how investors can cause change in companies. First of all, by enabling the growth of green companies. So, Selecting companies with a positive impact and helping them to grow. However, this does not work for large established companies. It only works for companies whose growth is limited by external financing conditions. So young companies, um, smaller companies, companies especially in immature financial market, the emerging markets, development countries, uh, and so on, where the allocation of capital makes really a change in growth path. The other channels how investors can uh, make a dent is by promoting improvement. This also works for large established companies in uh, efficient financial markets. So voting, engagement, uh, so ways in which investors really get in touch with a company and use their influence and rights as shareholders to make them a little bit greener. This works best for companies that have most uh, way to improve. So focusing on, on brown companies, making them a little bit uh, greener may make most sense. So to sum this up, I mean, to the initial puzzle, why haven't we solved the, the SDG funding gap or filled the SDG funding gap? If you look at, at all the sustainable investments, only a tiny part of it is really investments that trigger green growth. And also a rather small fraction is in, into approaches that really cause companies to become greener. And I think if you really want to, to take this enormous demand for green investments coming from different sites and, and translate it into impact, we need much more of these impactful investments that really cause change. If you're interested to learn more, we have put the, the, the key insights of our research in our investments, investors guide to impact. Please have a look. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Florian. Great. I think, could you just uh, post, you know, a link to download uh, the guide into the chat. That is great. People probably you have some further material to share with the people. Means basically, yes, you know, the investors could trigger a change, eh? but things have to be considered. Thanks once more. And our second speakers, our second speakers are Shivani, uh, Swami, and uh, uh, Crispino Lobo. Uh, your, uh, Crispino, sorry, Crispino Lobo has over 30 years of uh, engagement in. Uh, tackling water challenges and uh, environmental de degradation in rain-fed uh, and the dry land regions in India and internationally. Shivani has been working at uh, Living Guard uh, um, AG for the past seven years plus. And Living Guard uh, is a Swiss-based uh, life science company that uh, develops sustainable solutions across health and hygiene spaces. Shivani and uh, Crispino, we are now keen on learning from you how, you know, uh, it's a challenging topic we are talking about, you know, but uh, how you address troubleshooting or how you do the troubleshooting for funding gaps, innovative financing models, and so on. The world is yours. 
Um, Devi, I think the presentation is... That's the wrong presentation, yes. Yeah. We need a uh, uh, living guard presentation. Um, well, either way, um, I guess I'll start to save us time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Johannes, uh, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so, as uh, Johannes mentioned, Living Guard sure. is a Swiss-based um, health and hygiene company, and we've come up with solutions within the drinking water space. Um, these solutions are mainly at the community level, and so uh, what we have are these systems that can purify water anywhere between 100 to 500 liters per hour capacity um, without the use of any electricity for the purification process and without the use of any, um, without the wastage of any of the input water again for the purification process. So one would think that with a relatively sustainable and green technology that is low cost and easy to um, adopt in rural parts of emerging markets, why um, and how have we actually managed to scale? So uh, Living Guard has been working in this space for about 10 years now, and um, we have about 50 million Indian people uh, for our programs in India actually with access to drinking water through our systems. These have been, um, kind of placed across schools, railway stations, um, at the community level, uh, and they follow very simple four stages of purification, making them extremely easy to kind of um, maintain uh, at the local level. Um, and so what we did was we partnered with various kind of um, of corporates or um, international aid organizations that look at providing grants or some sort of funding within the water space. But the reality is in most cases funding uh, would be, you know, at a three to five year um, cycle and that's pretty much where you want to see an exit and um, an impact assessment or report. And what we found was if we had a project that had three-year funding or five-year funding, the funder at the end of the day wants to know that one, the program will be sustainable, and after they pull out, it will keep going, and two, that there's some measurable impact that has been created by this. And uh, while it might seem very easy, the reality is that um, the only way to make this possible is to actually work through partnerships. And that's where Watershed Organization Trust comes in. Um, and so what we do is we partner with organizations such as this to try and, and solve for the big funding gap. And you see it in the, in the way that for the first, say, three years, the capital investment for a system, the uh, consumables for a system might all be covered. But what happens when that runs out and who can fill in that gap? And our kind of conclusion was that for the most part, it's the community that we need to depend on because a community-based approach is um, finally the only sustainable thing that works. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Crispino and have him kind of take you through a bit of our journey. Uh, Crispino, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. So the main thing here is for these type of systems, is the sense of need, ownership, and the ability to, of people to organize themselves to run it successfully and to also generate the revenues to maintain such systems. Of course, Living Guard has a lock-in period of maintenance for three or five years, depending upon the project they have. But beyond that, it's the responsibility of the community. And so we need to be organize them to first want it and then help them to plan its operation and maintenance, which means, of course, first developing a whole system of planning, protection, and revenue generation. So upfront, in order to build a sense of buy-in as well as generate the resources, we get them to contribute as much as 20% of the capital cost of this project upfront, which they then invest in a bank and the interest of which later, maybe three or five years later, they would use then to support and continue the maintenance and eventual replacement of this, of this equipment. Then every month, they, they charge user fees. So there are two ways. Either the public, uh, the, the local governance body uh, pays for it, but then charges the people by way of water taxes. And they also install what is called as the water ATM. So, so that is the, the automated uh, teller system. You see where you pay uh, money, you have a card, you load it up front, then you take whatever water you want, very low rates. It's actually working out to between five to seven cents for about 20 liters. So it's very affordable. 
So, and the main thing is to organ the, the committee that runs this is largely dominated by women. You have to get in the women because at the end of the day, they have the greatest stake in, in man managing successful water systems. So when you do it this way, um, you can be pretty sure of first, that the unit is valued. Secondly, it'll be protected. Thirdly, it'll be managed well. Fourthly, revenues will be generated to maintain the operation cost as well as replacement costs. And lastly, by in, in involving the local governance body, that's the elected body, there is a sense of continuity as well as also legitimacy to the whole effort. So this is basically how you, how we support and operationalize for, from the perspective of sustainability, such uh, enterprises. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Shivani and uh, Crispino. You know, sorry, Debbie, that was my mistake. You know, I switched to presentations, but nevertheless, we are perfectly on time. And I would like to uh, actually proceed to our next speaker, Don Mukta. You know, Mukta, you are a young researcher of, uh, um, of Blue Humanities with a focus on hyper-social culture and uh, cohesion. You are here today as a research associate and a geo expertise to give us an insight on sustainable water financing, a very tricky area now in crisis, you know, in uh, conflict areas. The word is yours. Thank you so much, Johannes, for the introduction. After an insight into the investor and the company impact, I wish to illustrate the community impact uh, by presenting a case study focusing on participatory water governance and sustainable conflict financing in fragile contexts. But before that, a quick spotlight on our organization and what we do. Geo Expertise has successfully implemented water management and rehabilitation projects, hydrogeological surveys, and negotiation processes across four countries, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, and Niger. We specialize in re-establishing water supply networks and adapting new governance mechanisms in conflict societies by strengthening the local communities. This particular st case study is an outcome of a research partnership with the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, contributing further to the literature on water for peace building. In this World Water Week, um, we all have highlighted the gravity of the ongoing water crisis. It amplifies a million times more when it is set in a conflict society. Imagine there is widespread insecurity and looting. Water is now used as a weapon by the rich time. The, trend, the trained personnel has fled the country. There is no formal government body. The water infrastructure has been severely damaged. Water is neither an investment priority of the public sector nor the private sector. Such a context calls for innovative, adaptable, and scalable models and mechanisms. Let's unpack this case study further to understand what can be done. The project did a detailed analysis of water society relations and the post-conflict social structure at the local level in the implementation of water projects in Afrin area in northwestern Syria. It identified the unifying role of water for the Syrian society as it's the basic need and neutral substance for all. This project was hence built on the pillars of participatory water governance, community interaction, capacity building, and creating new social spaces. So who can be identified as the key stakeholders? First, seven water user associations were created, including both the local and the displaced population. They oversaw a realistic policy of distribution of drinking water among the beneficiaries at the household level, as well as the establishment of a system of financial contributions in line with the economic conditions of the beneficiaries. Geo Expertise provided the initial financing resources, training and capacity building workshops and the local community was engaged in the resource governance process. We have developed a strategy ensuring the alternation, complementary between the financing of NGOs operating in the area and the contribution of beneficiaries. Most water supply network projects fail because when the NGOs leave the area of operation, they lack funds and resources to keep the infrastructure up and running. This model tackled this issue by ensuring that the project remains self-sufficient even in the absence of an external governing body. Along with the water user associations, we created a savings contingency fund with the charges collected from the beneficiaries during the initial months of the project implementation. This fund was a result of accumulation of water fees paid 
um, which paid the operational costs for three months to allow the water user associations to establish a cash flow. This fund hence acts as a buffer ensuring the alternation between these two funding sources. The collection of fees from the beneficiaries is based on the principle of solidarity. That is, the economically marginalized families have been exempted from the water fee payment. The fees are set at 2,000 Syrian pounds, that is $2 per month per household. And it is estimated that 5% of households would not pay the fee due to the economic situation. This has led to the reduction in tensions between the local and the displaced beneficiaries over water sharing. The water user associations then resort to the saving fund, which is replenished every month with a cost recovery mechanism from 95% of beneficiaries. In the absence of a financing body, the WUAs resort to this fund to finance the operation of the stations, ensuring self-sufficiency, that is repairs, maintenance, and functioning of the community water supply network. In case any further infrastructure development is needed, the water user associations and the village mayors then contact NGOs operating in the area for further financial assistance. This brings me to the, our contribution to the roadmap towards systemic change in sustainable finance in the blue development nexus. This model can be scaled to other fragile contexts, and we urge the organizations to plan their exit strategies and ensure systematic handover of operations to involve and engage the local community in the resource governance process, which can help create new social spaces. And lastly, build on the existing knowledge and methods and build capacities to ensure the self-sufficiency of our water projects. Thank you so much. And you can get in touch with me if you have any more doubts. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mukta. Great, your insight. Uh, by the way, for me, we are a nice group of uh, 57 people, so just uh, actually, you see all the people now sitting around you, 57, that's nice, huh? so it's not just a virtual thing, we can also, you know, people are there physically in reality. And we move now to the next speaker. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Alin, you know, so we travel, I think you're now sitting in Iraq, as I understood. And um, Alin you know, is a water management specialist by education and the natural resources management by practice. Uh, connecting agricultural sanitation uh, waste and other environmental sectors with innovation business development and impact financing she likes working on the ground close to the people and close to the challenges that uh, uh, they'll see also sees opportunities and of course you know for the businesses now Aline please give us an insight in how you deal with uh, water businesses uh, and uh, impact investors in the Middle East Thank you, Johannes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to join this session. And I'm today taking on a more entrepreneurial perspective and speak about Siwa's experience working for several years in the Middle East, where we support water businesses develop more sustainable solutions and scale. And for that purpose, also partnering with impact investors who are keen to develop financing models that suit such businesses. So we understand ourselves really as a bridge builder for water impact um, investments. Who is CWAS? Uh, we are a Swiss organization specialized on water and environmental innovation. We develop and implement innovative solutions ourselves, but mostly we are focused on providing technical and business assistance and support uh, to entrepreneurs from ideation to scaling stage. We are ourselves mostly not providing financial assistance, but for that purpose, we work with, we advise, and we develop investment cases with uh, investment partners who we bring towards our entrepreneurs. And we operate globally, but our largest branch is in the Middle East. And here I want to give you two examples of running programs in which we are on one hand directly supporting enterprises, and on the other hand, engaging investment partners and testing different forms of financing. One is the first regional green accelerator program where we uh, help impactful companies to accelerate operations and build an investment strategy. 
And the second one is um, a consortium program called Water Energy for Food, where we and other partners are building the regional innovation hub. And here we scale innovators produce more food with less resource inputs. And this is a spotlight to some of the companies we work with. Um, here are 11 companies in our accelerator across the sectors from water supply to wastewater collection, wastewater treatment and reuse, um, water efficient agriculture solution, agriculture services, resource recovery solutions, and uh, also solid waste solutions. And many of these enterprises uh, we have worked with for many years and uh, they're used to doing bootstrapping. Why? Because they don't fit into traditional investment categories and they're still unclear what type of investment they need and for what. And on the other hand, we have investors coming into this thing that are interested in the sector, but still um, don't know much about it and the enterprises that are around. So our goal is to work with both to come up with suitable financing models that can really help scale the businesses and the impact. And I want to highlight a couple of practical tools that we want to, or that we are already using for that purpose. So one tool that we have developed in cooperation with uh, investment partners is an investment readiness tool for water enterprises that helps us to benchmark um, their maturity um, and helps us to develop coaching plans for them to build investment strategies that are also relevant for um, impact investors that we have at site. We have a toolbox for water enterprise typology, which we developed for investors that are trying to understand water enterprises better, their type of business, their solutions, their business model, their context, um, how commercial they are. We assessed lots of enterprises and built categories that we can show investors um, and tell them for these type of categories, these types of instruments have proven well. And here we often look at innovative instruments that are not traditional grant or traditional equity or traditional debt, um, but sometimes are more suitable to, to the type of water business and market um, and commercial level that they have. So we are looking at performance-based loans or contracts instead of grants, at convertible notes instead of equity or at revenue-based loans instead of traditional um, loans or, or debt mechanisms. Um, and we are collecting recently more and more information on the investment partners that are getting into the sector. We have been mapping them um, also online. I can share the link with you uh, in just a bit. And it's a global map. Here's just a spotlight on the MENA region. And um, yeah, we're adding more and more every week and month. Um, so I think this is a interesting development and we're happy to uh, share with you that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Also great. Thank you to you, Alin. Uh, and now let's travel back from the Middle East to Switzerland, and more precisely to Lucerne, you know, where we will meet Florian Strauss. Florian is a managing or is the managing director and chairman of uh, GWF. Um, a, this is a, a 120 years old uh, Lucerne based uh, family business specialized in measurement technologies for you utility metering, you know, sub-metering and uh, water and wastewater uh, measurement and of course also monitoring. Um, Florian will show you how shared investments uh, could also lead to shared benefits. The world is yours, Florian. Yeah, thank you very much, Johannes. Um, I tend to say that we are a 120 year old startup here based out of Lucerne. Okay. Continuously reinvent ourselves. Um, I have to say that I feel privileged to be part of this group and dedicate my career to something of the importance of water. I think that the recent weather events and other things show us once again how important all of our work is. Uh, we have heard very different perspectives on financing projects in earlier presentations and I take a little bit of a different angle. I'm a born optimist and events like these and the opportunity to meet with like-minded individuals show me that we will solve the global water crisis with the help of technology and smart people. Uh, this is one of our core beliefs at, at GWF. So let's get started with a famous man. Many of you uh, might know Peter Drucker. He famously said, you can't manage what you don't measure. In fact, I believe this is one of the most important governing thoughts, not only in business, but in particular in water management. 
let's drive this governing thought a few levels further because actually something is missing in Peter Drucker's quote. It's not only about measurement, it's about good measurement. I strongly believe that some of us are not yet aware that in water there is measurement, good measurement, and better measurement. So let's look at a few applications. What we do as GWF is highly accurate and reliable measurement of water and wastewater in various applications. These measurement points along the entire water cycle are critical to gain a better understanding on how water flows. And the data shows ways what we can do to improve its management and use. Measurement is basically in the center of the data generation and interpretation circle. Measurement has to be at the core for guided and targeted actions. Uh, and those actions can be uh, derived along four main areas. Improvement of revenue, the reduction of cost, the optimization of uh, asset management, and last but definitely not least, the whole topic of change management, including mindsets and behavior shifts. Uh, we believe that better measurement will lead to better decisions. And financing better measurement might be a challenge in projects because usually projects become more expensive in the beginning. Here's the surprising part. Impact, and especially measurable economic impact of projects, is a very good basis for innovative financing concepts. Imagine you can identify based on the use of better technology and improved business case. This is possible these days because there is more and more data available to draw business uh, baselines and compare business impact. Let's, let's look at one example. Uh, the next page or this page has a lot of information to digest. We see with the blue, red, black, and purple line, the comparison of the performance of four measurement devices. You, could, you can identify at first sight that there are pretty substantial differences. The purple one, for example, does not measure low flows and high flows. We say it has a limited dynamic range. Now imagine you have a user profile here in yellow that is constantly being under-registered by one or 2%. Or imagine you're using the data that you generate with a measurement device for dosing of additives uh, and you install the red meter. You will be constantly over-registering, so you pay a lot too much for your additives. Um, now, let's take a, uh, this example a step further um, and assume that we take our sonicometer, the best available uh, technology. The additional economic impact that you create with this device adds up quickly. And it adds up so quickly that you can finance the entire project only with the additional impact you generate. The issue is how can you translate this into money that is relevant to your project in the beginning? How can you move the impact forward to reduce your investment and make it easier to finance? Here, the shared benefit concepts come into play. You need to do two steps before you can actually decide on the concept. You need to develop a baseline and define the impact, and you need to assess the economic potential. Based on that, you can then reduce the initial investment burden in close collaboration with the project lead, of course, um, and share the risk and also the benefit over the agreed time frame. In the example from earlier, we cut investment in half and share the benefits over three years. The economics of this approach are interesting, uh, even, though, even though you are reducing the absolute value that you generate because the internal rate of return is higher. Um, it's clear that this approach doesn't work for every project, so you need to be careful when you apply these shared benefit concepts and you need to invest prior to the project in building the relationships, making sure that you get, get the baselines right. To sum it up, um, I do hope uh, as, as a managing director of a measurement company that I convinced you that better water measurement leads to better water management. Uh, I have shown you that better technology leads to faster payback and real economic impact. And based on this, reputable, uh, reputable manufacturers like us are very willing to co-invest and share risks. There are of course certain prerequisites that need to be in place. And the result of all this, um, with sharing risks and benefits, and by lowering the initial investments for really good technology, we can jointly implement more and especially more impactful projects. Thanks. Thank you, Florian. And again, uh, thank you to all you know, for six speakers. I think it was a very nice kind of a harvesting time you know, to harvest insights, experiences, concepts, approaches. 
which will me, uh, make um, me feeling good. I think there are a lot of entry points to change, to make change, to trigger impact. But now let's challenge uh, the speakers a little bit. And we invited two persons to challenge them. It's um, Fabrice from STC. I think I will then ask you, Fabrice, and also uh, Jabana to introduce yourself just shortly. Two sentences, sentences, not more, please. Um, so I um, uh, invited Fabrice from STC and Shabana from ARC for, for All. So your job is now a little bit, you know, to look, say a bit, you know, to do a, a, to take a little bit of an overarching perspective and look, you know, whether what whether this, what you learn today, what you hear, is also reflecting your, say, key um, uh, expectations when we talk about, you know, a sustainable development of a war sector. So I would start with you, Fabrice, just to go ahead, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Johannes. My name is Fabrice Fretz, and I work with the uh, Global Water Program at the Swiss Agency for Development and, and Cooperation. Um, my first question dwells around actually the, the question that was initially posed to, to all participants, you know, um, on why has the finance uptake by the water sector remained very small compared to, say, the energy uh, sector or the road sector? Uh, but to be perhaps a little bit more specific, I would like uh, to ask Florian Hebb or, or, or Florian Strasser, you know, is it in your view essentially because there is a lack of bankable project in the, in the water sector, even though the longer term social impact is actually a, a, a motivation that should compensate for possibly lower returns for impact investors? Is it because there is not enough measurement technology, Florian Strasser? And to Aline, perhaps, what is the typical profile of your water investors? You know, are there more water investors in the Middle East because it's a region where perhaps the value of water is more apparent or more strongly felt? So I'll stop there for the first question. Thank you. I think your question, Fabrice, links very nicely to this uh, poll. Actually, we did, and uh, Marisa is, is now just sharing the screen. Here we get a, a kind of a keywords also probably which could be considered or taken up by the two speakers. I think you addressed uh, the two Florians. So with the two Florians, Florian Heben, Florian Strasser. So who would like to start? Which Florian? Uh, okay, to... Florian Heben. Sorry, you will fast. <laughs> Good. Just, just over. I mean, I think a key reason is is below market returns. So. I mean, as, as you mentioned, I mean, many water sector investments are based in companies that, that solve some externalities that are not fully paid by anybody. So often these, these investments do not deliver the return like commercial investors seek. And, and often also, as, as Mukta illustrated, the most important investments are in the area of the risks are really high. So we, we have a bit, often in a situation where compared to just commercial investments, risk return ratios are not optimal. And I showed you these huge numbers of sustainable investing. Of that, only a tiny fraction, something like of this 4 trillion, 400 billions are impact investments. And you mentioned, you know, the positive social returns. I would say of these 400 billion, investors are really willing to, you know, forego profit for positive investment. It's even a more tiny fraction. So I think it's a bit the to hope that investors will take cuts in returns for positive impact. It's really a, a big estimate to make. I wouldn't rely on it. And, and here, I think a really interesting approach is blended finance, where state actors come in and, and, and work on the risk characteristics, on the return characteristics, then to channel you know, these huge amounts of capital from impact investors or even larger sustainable interested investors and make them kind of market ready. In order, but of course, that, that it takes risk and financial resources of, of public actors. So blended finance is a key word here. Florian Strasser. Yeah, just to add to this, I think it's an excellent point that uh, factoring in externalities is not happening enough. Um, so uh, I believe that uh, there should be a much, much bigger focus on the actual impact generated. And the only way to do this is by by generating accurate data. Yeah? That's why, why we, in our projects, focus on getting the baseline right. Yeah? So we, in the end, after the implementation of a project, we can really understand the full impact. And it's surprising to me 
how often this is overlooked, how often we are just uh, uh, engaging in projects, mostly also driven through emotional efforts, uh, water is important, and we are not, not really uh, sharp enough in assessing the economic impact. Thank you. Fabrice, are you satisfied? Well, um, yes, absolutely. Thank you for, for, for these answers. But um, I, I had one more question. I think it was might have been forgotten to, to Aline with regard to the um, to the investor to the typical investor profile in the water sector and and to maybe the specificity of uh, of the region in which you are principally uh, active, Aline. Sure. Um, there is no one profile of that investor. I think we are in a region, actually like many developing regions, where impact investment itself is, is a very new topic. Um, I think maybe it just started to come up like one or two years ago that there are certain people who would call themselves impact investors. Um, I think before that, especially in the developing context, the water sector has always been um, very um, humanitarian or development um, looked at and, and also financed in that way. Um, and because of the reasons that were mentioned before, um, also not considered from a um, commercial perspective. Now, uh, on the other hand, we also didn't have many entrepreneurs in that sector either. Um, so there was not too much uh, to invest in. Um, but at the same time, I think now we have an interesting development where we have development actors looking at financing differently, um, being more open to uh, help facilitate blended finance, to uh, facilitate um, grants differently in a non-traditional manner. We have philanthropic organizations that look at um, also commercial investment with impact. Um, we have even uh, public companies, impact funds or, or investment funds that are ready to test the impact field. Um, some of them are maybe not yet water only, but they're, they're really testing their grounds to see, um, okay, what would I need to invest? How much risk am I taking? What are those uh, companies? How mature are they? Um, and then there are a couple of, of very recently established impact funds that are set up by different partners, um, consortia of development, private, public entities. Um, and I think all of them are in a testing phase and that's exciting. Um, I think that's the point where if we work together and involve, we can, we can um, hopefully come up with something that is effective. Super. And with that, I hand over to uh, Javana. Who are you and what is your challenging or what are your challenging questions to the speakers? Sure, thanks, Johannes. My name is Javana and I work on innovative finance at Aquaforol. Um, Aquaforol is a not-for-profit organization based out of the Netherlands, and we work mostly in parts of Asia and Africa. Um, so wonderful presentations. Uh, I have a couple of questions, so I'm gonna combine them so you can address them together. So if you had all the funding resources available in the world to you to do your job, uh, what do you still miss to bring systemic change and achieve SDG 6? Uh, and I need some specific answers here. Um, and my second question is, are we now shifting the focus after, you know, failing to achieve um, access to safe drinking water and sanitation to now uh, new jargons of innovative finance and blended finance? Are we shifting the focus now by bringing in additional investments versus improving the existing, uh, uh, you know, investments through effective and intentional deployments so I'm really curious to understand from this group of people who do amazing work, like, do you, do you really believe uh, that innovative finance and impact investment is now going to change what we didn't manage to change in many years before? Nice to have all the money you need, huh? But a nice question. You know, what is then still missing? Probably we start with that one. Eh? And um, who would like to, to start? Shivani, you are smiling. Uh yeah, I mean, uh, I guess if I had to say uh, at least one point that uh, resonated immediately was that you can't really, you can have all the money in the world, but unless you have um, the local buy-in and that local trust, no project's going to uh, last for very long. And you could hear it in Mukta's um, presentation, um, as well as uh, 
when Crispino was talking about WOTR's approach that today, if you have trust from the community and you build um, safe spaces, that's, on, that's the only time where you'd have um, the possibility that a project would be successful. Great, I think uh, Mukta. Yes, I would like to quickly chip in to what Shivani said right now. I think uh, abundance and sustainability uh, do not always go hand in hand. And I think there are a lot of mechanisms to put in place to in order to regulate um, that lot of money that we have received um, in order to uh, make any project sustainable in the longer term. Um, so that's something that uh, I think we, all the organizations need to uh, highlight and focus on. But there was a second question. Who would like to pick this up? Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the local, thank you. Apart from the local level, Shavana, if you really want scale at the country or regional level, you need to get also political buy-in, and also you have to ensure that the policy framework or what you call the structural framework is supported. Number one, and number two, you need to get a, a consensus, both in terms of need, approach, desirable outcomes, and participation of all the stakeholders. Under, underlain by political will to, to deliver desired outcomes. So unless you bring both the micro and the macro together, supported by all the money you can get, which anyone would be happy to have, uh, you won't really have long-term at scale sustainable outcomes. There's still a second question. Would you like to repeat it again? Just uh, one sentence to recall it in the minds of our colleagues. Sure. Uh, my second question was that um, it's 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 basically open for debate um, because we're talking about impact investment and innovative finance, and we've had development aid for many years. Are we now coming up with these new models and mechanisms just because um, you know uh, just because you want to do things differently, or we genuinely believe and feel it is going to do the trick now? So is it about additional investments or is it about effective investments or using our current resources or development aid more effectively? I'm just curious to understand where does this panel kind of like stand in terms of their belief um, in, into these concepts? Would you like to start Florian, Abe? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one point is, is the challenge is huge. So in, in terms of funding needed to solve the water crisis and water challenge is it, I think, we're not going to solve it with development aid money itself. We need more and we have, so we need to somehow tap into commercial capital markets. And there's something like 300 billion of wealth globally that can solve. I mean, there is enough money that that's not the problem. And so I think we using then public money as discussed before, blended finance to, to channel this huger pot of money into the places where, where it should go. I think that's, I think for, to me, the, 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 the place where we should spend a lot of a lot of thinking and but we maybe also need to change mindsets. I think there's a lot of many people struggle with the notion that public actors should, you know, give better conditions to commercial investors to do that. So that sounds kind of repugnant to many kind of why should we give large investors our tax money just to make them invest into a good product. But I think we working on on these ways how to channel money into the sector i think here innovation can really help thank you florian who would like to add well i mean i'm happy to but um the danger is because i probably just repeat what florian just said it's important that we move away from only seeing the good cause in doing water projects uh, there is a commercial background for this, and there is a viable business case in many infrastructure projects. Um, it's just being overlooked because, yeah, as I said earlier, the data is missing. Yeah? And I think there we, we really need to double down and professionalize also the way we are running water projects. Super. Thank you. Now let's have a look, you know, into uh, questions of uh, the audience. Uh, Devi. What do you see now in our uh, Slido? What, yes, question? there's one question which is highly on the top. Um, I'll read it out to you. It says, is it really realistic that rural water suppliers charging affordable prices and true service 
sustainability are going to achieve attractive financials. Who would like to pick it up? Silence. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can uh, tackle one bit of that. And that's uh, to say that depending on the project, depending on the program uh, and technology selection, if you look at a shared responsibility or a blended financial model, um, it might not be yielding extremely high returns, but it could be yielding adequate returns that in today's uh, ever-changing investment landscape, it can be uh, something that can definitely be tried and then depending on lessons learned, um, scaled up. Though I guess perhaps either one of the Florians or Aline would be able to kind of shed more light on that bit. Aline, you have examples, probably you could concrete stories you could share. Yeah, I think we have a couple of stories of, of quite entrepreneurial business models um, that are not highly commercial, but they are only using um, um, a bit of the development funding that would be needed otherwise to, to run the entire extended distribution of water supply to, to very rural or remote areas um, with different type of, of uh, from water kiosks to other type of franchisee systems um, to really uh, yeah, get an effective distribution set up. Um, and there have been investment cases into such companies um, from North Africa to, to other places in Africa. I can at least recall like uh, three, four, five um, that uh, used um, yeah, innovative financing, not grants, not traditional equity, but everything in between to really build that business and that service. And I think it's more um, effective and, and efficient and sustainable often than a, a pure development approach. I mean, I think that's what the results have shown. Not to say that setting up such a business is easy, but I do think it's a good alternative to the traditional development approach. Thank you. I just would like really to make use out of the questions ra raised by the, by the audience. Uh, David, I think, could you probably just uh, tell us, you know, what else is on top of the list? Mm -hmm. of the yeah, there's, an, there's another one. Um, how could official development assistance be better used to improve investment conditions for water? That's a good one. By the way, by the way, all the challenges can actually answer. Huh? Uh, it's not forbidden. Well, if I may uh, chip in, Johannes, indeed, I think I mean the instruments of blended finance, you know, don't uh, are not limited to to guarantees um, to limit the risk exposure of, of commercial lenders. But I think what is important also is technical assistance. Um, I don't know whom was speaking before of, you know, um, improving the enabling in environment. And I think that's where, uh, probably, uh, ODA has, a has a big role to play, uh, uh, as well. Floor is open to everybody. Maybe one point connecting to what Florian Strasser said before, I think in a very interesting spot to use public money is to create markets for externalities paying. I mean, as we often have a lack of, I mean, business models fail because externalities are not paid for. That's a place where at least temporarily public funding can be used. I, for example, I really like the example of SYNC by, by Roots of Impact, I think, which also is, is pioneered by the STC where with specific contracts to companies, they, they pay for externalities that then enables a viable business models that then enables investments by more commercial investors. A market yes. for externalities. Jonas, if I may just chip in quickly, uh, also connecting with the sync uh, work that Apple for All is also doing with Roots of Impact. I, we feel that ODA has a role, a bigger mandate on both sides. So both with impact investors, but also with social enterprises and financial institutions, because the money is flexible. And so it could be used to um, build the market from both ends. So we do not have to choose sites. So we can de-risk the investors, but we can also speed up the process 
that the companies become investable. And that's the challenge we face at, in the water sector. And that's what we're trying to do at Aquahole to see how technical assistance together with a financial instrument could be used to move things faster. Because if we just wait for instruments to come in and not build the market, we're not gonna see the results. Thank you. We are getting close to the end of our session and I would like to just ask you two challenges. What is the most important message or say insight you take home today? Let's now start with you, Shavana. Uh, for me, the, the take home message is that I think we're heading towards the right direction. It's just a matter of speed and it, it's a matter of speed. And that means that system, systemic changes are complex and complicated. Uh, the question is, how fast can we move before the system changes again? <laughs> so I think for me, that's a takeaway. And I'm really happy to see how different parts of the system uh, were represented today in, in, in the session. So really appreciate that. Thank you. And also, you know, how things actually come together, coming from different points and you know, aspects, and the, but generating a kind of a logic and also consistent picture of how the future could look like. Thank you, Shabana. Fabrice. Yes, Johannes, the message I take back uh, is really that um, it, one needs a, uh, an array of, um, of solutions. There is not but one solution, but really a different, you know, be it ODA, Shabana was, was asking her question around that. But, and I really believe it's, it's a mix of all these instruments. I mean, it's about blended finance, it's about impact investment, certainly about ODA uh, 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 still to a, to a certain extent, but also and very much so more and more um, about consumers, water consumers, you know, taking uh, uh, that into their own hand and making sure that sustainability is, uh, is ensured. I mean, uh, Chris Pino was, was speaking about that, about, uh, you know, setting the appropriate rates or tariffs uh, for water. And I think that is what in the end will, um, will really ensure sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on our agenda would now be a kind of a wrap up, but you know, to do a serious wrap up in three minutes, that's probably not serious. That's why I think it was nice to get you, all, you know, like last take home, Serge Van and uh, Fabrice. And what I would like uh, to ask all, particularly, of course, uh, the speakers, if you have any, you know, interesting stuff to share here, just post it into the chat now. Huh? while we finally close. So we have a few minutes uh, and, but what I would like to do, to do of course, is to uh, say thank you. Huh? To say thank you to all the people who joined us tonight. I think we had, I just was a bit, you know, observing, monitoring uh, uh, actually the list of participants. And, you know, we peaked up to around 70. The good news is we started actually with a smaller amount and we had a good peak and uh, we are still more than 50. So a great thank you to all of you who joined us. And then of course, a great thank you also to the speakers. You know, you think such a one hour uh, actually event is just a small thing to organize, but I tell you, it took us a lot, many meetings to make really, to make the thing really happening. And so I think you invested all a lot of time. Uh, really thank you from uh, also our side, from the side of all the organizers. The challenges, I think you did a very important and good job. Sometimes, you know, you are like a bit, you know, you know, locked into our concepts. And when you get these challenging uh, questions, then you can a bit, you know, shake the system in, in a good way. But, you know, finally, also, I would like, of course, to uh, say thank you to um, Marisa and to Davy. You know, we were quite quiet today, but they did a super good job, you know, in the background, organizing everything, you know. Uh, I tell you, it's not so easy to bring them. You know, just have all the presentations finally, you know, ready. And um, I would say that's an applause to uh, Marisa and to to Davy. Thanks a lot. And uh, with that, I would like to close. It was was great to have you on board today. And um, I learned a lot. I take a lot of uh, actually insights back home. And again, you know, what pleases me very much is that you know things are coming together. Probably still some connections have to be uh, in some way fostered, but things come together. Uh, let's together go ahead and have a nice evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so Goodbye, much. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.